The Tiger and the Swan, Cassie Alexander, narrated by Bunny Warren. Namir was following me out to my car after my shift at Rax's casino for the fifth night in a row. He wasn't even trying to be subtle. So once I'd beeped my Honda Civic open, I whirled on him. I know you're there. How could I not? Namir was a massive man, with medium brown skin, black hair, and a tightly trimmed beard. He had green eyes that I could still almost see in the dark. And he was wearing the same suit he wore as second-in-command on the casino's floor. As Rax's casino catered exclusively to shifter clientele and some few brave or insane humans, that was saying something. He stopped a good 30 feet away from me and shrugged, making his suit's crisp shoulders roll up and down. I'm not hiding, Lily. I'm making sure you get home safe. Uh Uh-huh. A smile lit up his face, and he lifted up both hands, protesting his innocence as he started walking closer. Fine. You can talk to HR tomorrow. I crossed my arms. I wasn't aware we had an HR. We don't really, he said, still smiling. It's just me. But if you want, your next shift, I'll send Charles out here instead. He stopped again, just five feet in front of me, and looked around warily. You're a popular dealer, Lily. You walk out with a wad of cash big enough to choke a horse each night. I'm just keeping Rax's assets safe for him. Of course, I said with a hint of sarcasm. From this close, I could scent the musk of what Namir was on him. A tiger shifter and it should have terrified me. As a swan maiden, I'd been attuned to predators my whole life. But there was something about being around Namir that felt less like danger and more like electricity. Of course, he repeated, much more kindly than I had. I paused, torn between ripping him a new one for thinking me incapable of managing myself versus finding something about his presence there wholesomely proprietary. In the great mass of people I didn't know and would never meet in this city, it was almost, but not quite, charming that someone cared. Get in your car and I'll watch you leave, he said, jerking his chin at my ride. I turned to my car and opened up the door. I bet that's not the only thing you'd like to watch, I quietly muttered, then slammed my door shut solidly, watching him give me a low wave as I drove off. I took Route 412 home after that, checking in my mirrors to make sure I wasn't being followed the whole time, because this was the longest I'd stayed anywhere. My parents had both been swans. They'd taught me how to survive in the world, and right now, I was doing pretty much the opposite. Unlike the other shifters I was surrounded by at work, my shifting ability wasn't innate, something I could control, or something pulled by the moon. I could only shift if I was wearing my feathers, like a featherskin cloak. And if I wasn't, and someone else got hold of them, they could control me. It was why my parents had kept me as sheltered as possible. They'd given each other their feathers when they'd mated, then burned them, choosing to never become swans again rather than take the risk of being parted. But they'd known I was like them the second I was born with a downy white call and they would have protected my feathers with their lives, up until the point I was old enough to be in control of them, which I now was. I'd been on my own for years, doing what I was supposed to be doing, using magic to hide who I was and change my scent, and moving every few months to a new place before anyone could get attached to me, or get too curious. But when I'd heard about the vault at Rax's casino because the casino was a front for the Dragon Shifter's magical object racket, I couldn't resist. The price the Dragon Shifter had quoted me to store my feathers was usurious. $50,000 a year. But at the thought of them finally being safe, it seemed worth trying for. So here I was, six months into a job for the first time in my life, with $30,000 saved up due to high tippers and me living off of ramen, and maybe, just maybe, in another four or five months, my feathers would be safe. Then I'd get the dragon shifter to put me on a monthly payment plan until I could have a real life without looking over my shoulder all the time. 
And then maybe it wouldn't matter so much if I found myself being followed by a cat. Maybe I could even slow my roll finally. Maybe I could turn around and give the cat a pet. I parked in front of my house, sure that my secret was safe for another night, and thinking about Namir, when I realized my front door was open. I ran through the devastation of my home, the couch that had been slashed, the TV that had been ripped off the mount, from my bathroom, where I found my mirror shattered and the wall caved in behind it, leaving chunks of drywall in the glass. My feathers were gone. I grabbed hold of the sink, got a fistful of glass, and wouldn't have even noticed it except for the red streaks my own blood left behind. Static rushed in my ears, my pulse thumped at my throat. Someone else had my feathers. I could already imagine their leash around my neck. It was only a matter of time. I stumbled back into my living room before I collapsed and managed to get my phone out. I called the only person who I thought could help me, the only other person nearby who might care. Human resources, Namir teased after picking up. I couldn't form words. I could barely breathe. Lily, he quickly asked, realizing something was wrong. Are you all right? No, I whispered. Lily, he said, making my name into a growl of concern. Where are you? And when I didn't answer fast enough, home, he guessed. Stay there. I'm coming to get you. I heard him shout a muffled order to someone else before I regained his full attention. No, wait. If it's not safe, go a few blocks away. Text me an address. It didn't matter. Nothing did. Everything was crashing down. Lily! He shouted my name one last time before I managed to hang up. I had only the vaguest connection to my body when Namir had arrived. He'd patted me roughly, making sure I wasn't hurt, and then had searched the house, seeing all the same things I had. Then he picked me up and put me into his sports car. I didn't know where he was taking me. It probably didn't matter. Soon I wouldn't care about anything, ever again. Was this what it would feel like when I was controlled? When some man slid on my feathers and demanded things of me? Would I feel this great distance between myself, the true me, and the rest of the world forever? And when I could next pay attention to anything, I was swaddled in warm blankets, sitting on a broad leather couch in front of a crackling fire, my hurt hand cleaned and wrapped. There was a steaming mug of coffee in front of me, as well as a glass of whiskey with a ball of ice in it. And Namir was in another leather chair, off to the side, his elbows on his knees, watching me with eyes that gleamed like a cat's in the firelight. I wasn't sure what you'd want when you got better, he said. He was in the same suit he'd had on earlier, only now his tie was undone. I pushed the blankets around me down. They all smelled like his tiger. Masculine, musky, like danger personified. Better, I repeated, and gave a soft laugh. He pulled his whole chair closer. What happened, Lily? I saw your place. I opened my mouth up and nothing came out. I never talked about my feathers. You could only tell people you absolutely trusted about them, and past the mythology of being swans, my parents had told me all the horror stories. All the swan men and women who'd shown their feathers to the wrong person, who'd then lost their sense of self, been forced to get married to strangers, and have their children trapped until they could escape, if they could escape. All the swans who'd thought that they'd had true love, only to find out that they'd been wrong. Lily, Namir said my name again, and put a comforting hand on my knee. I was still wearing my dealer's uniform from the casino, a crisp white linen shirt and a short black mini. When I dragged my eyes up to meet his, his whole expression was full of tense concern. Was Namir safe? At the casino, yes. He was actually great there. For all that Namir was a predator, when I was on shift, I knew he always had my back. He always knew the difference between players having a good time, chatting me up, and giving me tips, versus the ones who got handsy after winning a few, who felt like the chip they'd tossed in my direction meant that I owed them. 
He had no problem throwing out drunks or obnoxious flirters, most times even before I had to say a thing. But here, and with this, I closed my eyes and swallowed, hoping that whatever instinct I had right now in my belly was right. What kind of supernatural creature do you think I am? I asked him. He frowned and took a deep inhale. You've always got protective magic on you, so while I figure you're a shifter, you're not anything strong. My lips twisted to the side. I was when I was a swan. Swans could fuck your shit up. It was just that I didn't want to stay a swan for the rest of my life. And if you don't want other people to know what you are, he added, it's why you need protection. Well, he wasn't wrong there. He was just too late. Lily, he asked again, quietly, when I'd taken too long. I'm a swan maiden, I blurted out, ripping off the scab. My powers to shift are tied to my feathers. It's like a feather skin coat. When I wear it, I'm a swan, and when I take it off, I'm human. But if someone else gets a hold of it, they can control me. Namir made a low, growling sound on my behalf, and his hand tensed on my knee. And that's what was hidden in your wall behind your bathroom mirror? Yeah, I breathed. Do you know who took them? I swallowed and stared into space over his head for a moment, thinking, before lowering my head into my hands to hold. No, though I can guess why. If whomever had stolen my feathers hadn't put them on yet, and I knew they hadn't because I still felt free, then they probably stole them to sell to the highest bidder, and soon I'll be trapped as some rich man's plaything. The fuck that's happening, Namir said with enough intensity to snap my head back up. He stood and started pacing. Are you sure they'll auction it? Not 100% positive, but it seems likely. Let me make some calls, he said, stalking off. He went around the corner to where I couldn't see him, and rather than get my hopes up, I chugged coffee and liquor in turns. When he returned, his expression was still dark. Anything? I asked, embarrassed by the quaver in my voice. I know people who know people, he said, giving me a tight half-smile. Don't worry, Lily. I'll find them for you and bring them back. He glanced between the beverages I'd polished off. You should rest now. You've had a night. Namir's place was only lit by firelight. There were windows along the far wall, but all the curtains were drawn. It was dawn by now, though. It had to be. And this might be my last free day on Earth. I don't think I can sleep. I mean, what if it happens when I do? And when I wake up, I don't belong to myself anymore. And I'm at some stranger's beck and call. Namir moved to sit on his heels in front of me. I don't make idle promises, Lily. I will bring them back for you. I wanted to believe him, but I didn't dare. How can you be so sure? He paused for a long moment before answering. Because, he said simply, I want you to belong to me. Everything in his bearing said that that was the case. The way he was looking at me now, the intensity he radiated. I lost the ability to think, to breathe again, filled by an entirely new type of panic, a thin thread of hope, tangled with fear, knotted with longing. I took a ragged breath and frowned, quickly looking at my lap. You don't really know me, Namir. And there's a very good reason for that. You work for me, essentially, and I'm not an asshole. But that doesn't mean it's not true, Lily. I feel pulled when I'm around you. And now I wish like fuck I'd told you sooner. I made myself look up at him. It's just because I'm a bird and you're a cat. I shook my head, trying to deny it. And you're just saying that because you always get your way. Not always, he said softly, but giving me a dark smile. Just most of the time. Was he really flirting with me at a time like this? Must be nice to be a predator then. I crawled back on his couch, curling up into a ball. You don't know what it's like to always be afraid. Namir rose up on his knees on the ground in front of me, casting me in shadow, and I could hear him breathing hard. That's where you're wrong, Lily. Because right now, at this very moment, I am 
deeply afraid of losing you. His revelation made me gasp again. I'd spent years thinking that some fraction of the people in my parents' stories deserved what they got, for not playing it safe, for being stupid enough to fall in love. Up until now, I'd had no idea what they'd been through. Namira's suit rose and fell as his chest heaved. Do you feel it too, Lily? He asked in his low voice as he leaned forward to clutch the edge of his couch with both hands. I swear to you, no matter what, I will get your feathers or die trying. But if you don't, put me out of my misery. I put my hands to my face while looking at him. I don't know what I feel, Namir. I'm terrified. And if it's anything else... I've never felt this way before. But at the thought of him dying for my feathers, a piece of my heart kicked and screamed. I need you to be safe, though. I bit my lips until I couldn't stop it, and the truth came out. Because I want to know. His expression relaxed a little, and he nodded deeply, then looked distracted, pulling out his cell phone. He grunted and stood after reading the screen. Rack sent me the address of two local magical object auction houses, one of which is having a rush auction tonight. I caught my breath and finally started to feel sane. Okay, then. Let's make a plan. Namir shook his head. I'm not involving you, Lily. Not unless your plan is letting me throw you into Rax's vault for safekeeping. The vault that had gotten me into this mess in the first place. I snorted. No, Namir. They're my feathers. I have to go. No, he said more firmly. But I stood up to follow him, whether he liked it or not. Lily he said, catching my shoulders. To keep your secret, I'm going to have to kill everyone who knows your feathers exist. It's going to be dangerous and exceedingly messy. I watched his jaw clench as he willed me to believe him. I don't want you there to distract me, and I don't want you to see me like that. I swayed, stunned, and felt his fingers tighten to keep me upright. You're not kidding, are you? I whispered. No, I'm not. And... You'd do that? For me? I blinked and felt my throat closing up. How much more could I even take today, tonight, whenever this was? It's all right, Lily. I'm used to this. I didn't mean to scare you, Namir said. Then his brow rose some, as did the corners of his mouth. Can I put you in Rax's vault, though? Because now that I've mentioned it, that seems like a really good idea. No! Because this is all his fault. Yeah... Namir cut me off, nodding slightly with a frown. He told me to tell you he's sorry. If he'd known the stakes, he never would have asked for money. I shook his hands off of me. Fuck his apology. Wait, you told him? My voice rose in horror. I'd only just told Namir about my feathers, and here he'd gone and told someone else? Had to, Namir said in a sympathetic tone. I'm sorry, but your secret's safe with him. He's mated and richer than God, and he's letting me raid his armory for tonight. My hands clenched into helpless fists at my side. I thought I might have had feelings for Namir for a handful of seconds, and he'd already gone and betrayed me? He stepped back and started re-knotting his tie, like a man long used to the habit. I need to go, Lily. Stay here. I'll come back when things are finished. Namir... I started to protest being left behind and having someone else even vaguely in charge of my life. Then I realized that this might be the last time I saw Namir alive. I could almost feel him pulling back from me as he finished his tie's knot. It was like he was putting armor on. Don't go, I said instinctively. His green eyes gave me a soulful, worried look. Lily, he began, and I ran up to kiss him. It wouldn't even have been possible if I hadn't had heels on and I caught him completely by surprise. I'd only meant to give him a quick kiss on the lips, but then he grabbed me before I could rock back very far. His eyes searched mine, my lips parted, and his came for them. Namir wrapped his arms around me, and a second later his tongue was in my mouth, stroking mine, asking me for more. I tried to give as good as I got, and found myself melting without meaning to, pressing up against him. He made a satisfied sound and started to dance me backwards, so I threw my arms around his neck for balance. We'd moved every few months when I was growing up, for my safety, and when I was an adult I'd been obsessed by my endless quest for survival. 
which meant I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I'd never felt safe enough around anyone to be kissed by them, much less fucked. But now, this was happening. Namir pulled his mouth away from mine, and I tried to follow it. I wasn't done kissing him yet, and I definitely was not done with him kissing me. And he chuckled. He put his forehead to mine, and his eyes searched mine. Yeah? He asked. Yeah, I breathed and started kicking off my heels. He reached down and easily picked me up, making me squeal. My skirt hitched up as I wound my legs around him. I could feel the hard promise of him underneath his suit slacks and tried to grind against it. Eager little bird, he whispered, kissing me against my neck before laying me down on his couch. I won't make it into my bedroom with you. That's okay, I whispered back. I just wanted this. Wanted everything. Now. Before anyone else could take it away from me. Namir groaned again and pulled his suit jacket off before quickly undoing his tie and letting it slide off like a snake. He had one hand above my shoulder, the other at his belt, and then he paused. Wait, he said. Swan maiden? He asked. Is that literal, Lily? Like, you're a virgin? I felt myself flush beneath his gaze. Does it matter? He rocked back and considered this. It does to me. I hit my head against the leather couch behind me and rolled my eyes. Oh, come on, Namir. He took the hand from his belt to take my chin, leaning over me to make me look at him. His scent was intoxicating from this close, and everything about him set off everything about me. His pupils were wide, his nostrils flared, hips were pressed to mine, and things I hadn't ever felt safe wanting before rushed to the surface. To taste his skin, to feel his touch, to have him in me. My imagination had sometimes been torturous, but now that he was here, it was all so much worse. I bit my lips and made a sound I wasn't proud of, begging for him. And I watched his green eyes flash into a dangerous cat's slitted pupils. Do you have any idea how hard I'll fight to come back and be the first in you, little bird? He asked me, and the tone he asked it in made me shiver. I shook my head against his hand, and he gave me a wicked grin. If I had to, I'd kill everyone in this state. As thrilling as that was to hear, I couldn't stop myself from asking. But what if you don't? My voice was tiny and high. What if this is the last chance I get to make up my mind? Namir moved back to survey me. I wished I could twist away to hide from him. I knew I was a mess. My long, light blonde hair had fallen out of my dealer's bun and was in tangles. I knew my nipples were hard enough to show through my thin bra and shirt, and I was dripping so much I'd probably ruined his couch. I promise you it won't be, he said. His hands reached for mine and used them to slowly pull me up, being gentle with my wounded hand. I will be so careful with you, Lily, but because I care for you, now is not the time. I swung my legs down, pressing my knees together, both furious at him and still somewhat frightened. I don't even know if careful's what I want. Then we'll figure it out together. He brought my unbandaged hand up to his lips, brushed a kiss across it, then grabbed his tie and stood to walk out his door. Ten minutes later, I was done cleaning myself up in his bathroom. That smug motherfucker. How the fuck dare he cut me out of getting my own feathers back? They were mine and no one else's, and it was all too easy to imagine him out there putting something on a billboard about them when he was through. He'd already gone and told Rax. I could feel myself winding up. The patterns of my fear and anger were familiar trails inside my head. But maybe Namir didn't deserve that. Yet. He was a fool, though, if he thought I was just going to stay behind and wait for him. And he wasn't the only one who knew how to find shit. Swans had been on their own, protecting each other for centuries. I had a duty to warn the rest of my kind. And also, humiliatingly tell my parents what had happened, before someone else controlled my whole life and I couldn't anymore. I picked up my phone and logged into a website one of the oldest of our kind had made, as a clearinghouse for information that had 12-factor identification practically. 
and told my story, in case it helped anyone else escape my fate, and in case anyone else was in a position to help. Then I called my mom and dad and had the worst phone conversation I'd ever had to have in my life. My parents tag-teamed on the phone with me, my mother buying plane tickets out to rescue me somehow. Did airlines give breaks for pre-bereavements, for when someone was going to metaphorically die? Well, my father did his best to sound rational and keep her sane. He swore they'd find me, and that they'd find my feathers for me. But in reality, they were a thousand miles away on the other coast, and if someone bought my feathers and told me to never talk to them again, I wouldn't. I didn't tell them anything about Namir. I didn't want to offer them any false hope. And in the end, we cried with each other on the phone for a good 30 minutes before I started worrying about my phone's battery, and we all made ourselves hang up. After that, I wandered into Namir's bedroom, wondering if he'd have one of those phone charging pads I could use on his nightstand. Also, I was curious if there were any other signs of women around. Since whatever level of experience I was sexually, Namir was the opposite of. But his bedroom was just more unadulterated manliness, like the tiger himself. Done in bronzes and blacks, with a few pictures on the wall. Nice pieces of art. And a bed that wasn't made, but that smelled like him. It turned out, after talking to my family, for possibly the last time while I was still myself, I wasn't done crying yet. So I started, crawling into his bed, salting his pillows with my tears, and somewhere along the way, sleep got me. When I woke up much, much later, my phone battery was at 15%. But several other swans had gotten back to me, some to tell me stories of their own survival, how they'd gotten their own feathers back after long periods of servitude, and for me to not give up. Others to say goodbye, that they'd be praying for me. But in the middle of all of these was one swan who'd briefly lived locally and felt like they'd been stalked last year, who'd caught a picture of the guy before she left in the night, and now she was ever so sorry she didn't post his photo at the time. He did look a little familiar, and as I scrolled back in my mind through every punk who'd tried something with me at the casino, yeah, if that guy had a shaved head, because he had the exact same scar near his hairline as I remembered. Namir had thrown him out on my behalf last month, muttering something about fucking hyenas all the while, before telling him to never come back. I was good at making superficial friends and fitting in, so it was nothing to send out a frantic message to the dealer's girls chat pretending to have the hots for a hyena shifter I'd met, and where did they all hang out? And sure enough, one of their boyfriends was friends with one, and told her to tell me the bar where they liked to frequent. I used almost the last of my phone's battery to summon a ride. The hyena bar was divetastic, with bad lighting and dubious hygiene. I still had my purse on me. I'd found it at Namir's place, and in it, the wad of tips I'd been on my way home with the prior night. So I tried my luck with the bartender, the person sitting in the darkest corner of the place, regulars at the bar, and people coming in, flashing cash and showing them my screenshot of the picture the other swan had taken, telling them he was either the father of my child, a long-lost boyfriend, someone who killed my non-existent dog, anything crazy enough that would get the man himself a texted warning that there was a strange woman with ice blonde hair passing out cash for his attention. Because the only thing that would make the feathers they were auctioning off even more valuable was actually auctioning them off with their swan. I spent an hour there, acting essentially unhinged, until my phone was dead and I was out of cash, and then I knowingly stepped out the back alley where I was jumped. The shifters who grabbed me were too busy congratulating themselves on the easiest kidnapping of all time to realize that I didn't scream, not even before they put tape on my mouth. They were all blustery and overconfident, and they didn't stop talking excitedly in the car after they'd put a bag on my head and driven off. I wondered if Namir was all right, and also if I should have told him about this scheme. The only thing that had stopped me was the knowledge he'd definitely have come back to his condo and tied me to a chair. But what he didn't understand was that my feathers were mine, and if I got them back on my own, it'd prove I didn't need him, because I didn't want to need anyone. I wanted to be wanted, yes, but not predicated on some servile version of love 
purchased by rescuing my feathers for me. How would that be any better than my feathers being sold? My love wasn't something you could barter for, and I wanted to be as equal, not as underling, which is why I hoped like hell the rest of my rather foolish plan would work. The car we were in stopped, and the shifters in it pulled me out into the night. I was still wearing my heels from work, off balance with my wrists behind my back. One of the shifters shoved me to go faster, and I fell, scraping both my knees, groaning in pain behind the tape they'd covered my mouth with. They laughed at me, yanked me up, and kept propelling me forward until I was indoors. I knew because my heels were suddenly clattering on tile. The air changed from the humid outdoors to air-conditioned, and they suddenly took an interest in my health, two of them practically picking me up, one on each elbow, to make sure I didn't take a header down a flight of stairs. I was rudely shuffled into a room, a door slammed, and the bag over my head was finally taken off. It was the man from the casino. He had the same scar from his forehead up into his hairline. The other swan's intel had been right, and I knew my feathers were here. I could practically feel them. I swiveled my head around the room, trying to figure out where they were at. Did you really think this was a good idea, ballerina? He asked, stepping up to me. I couldn't answer him till he ripped the tape off my mouth. Ha ha, Swan Lake, I get it, I said, and then spat at him. He wasn't expecting that. He swiped it off his face and made a vicious snarl. I braced for a blow that I was sure was coming. And then he squinted at me, reaching forward to grab my jaw roughly and swipe my cheek with his thumb. The tape had torn my skin, and there was blood on it. He looked between it and me like I'd been lying to him somehow. And this was it, my only amazing ploy. How obscenely normal I was without my feathers on. I don't shift like you. I don't heal without my feathers. I twisted my injured hand up for him to see and took a swing at his groin with one of my bleeding knees. So you'd better let me put them on or you'll be selling damaged goods. Some guys had paid more for this, he said, giving me a gesture. He had a weird wheeze on his inhale that made it sound like he was laughing. Sure, but the true pervs would want to beat me up themselves, don't you think? I looked around the shabby office we were in. I doubt they'd want to outsource it to a shady-ass shifter parts dealer like you. He snarled, and I made a face at him. Yeah? A hyena's afraid of a swan? You think you can't handle me? I said it in my most mocking tone, and then I rushed him. He batted me back, sending me bouncing to the floor, rattling my spine, definitely bruising my ass. There goes another hundred grand, I warned, and then I pulled the oldest trick in the bird book. The broken wing maneuver. I appeared to crumple. I never cried. I'd already cried more in this one day than I had in my entire life combined. But I dredged up the power to produce more tears now, suddenly bowing in front of him, sobbing big, fat, wet tears, my eyes going red and my nose going snotty. I just want to wear them one last time. Please. And then I'll be pretty and I'll do what you want. I'll be good. Just please, mister, please. It had to be coming up on auction time soon, so either this would work or Namir would save me. Maybe. God, please, may something just break my way. And some of my fake tears became real ones. The hyena snarled and cursed, then grabbed me by the hair, yanking me back in the room. I just needed to touch one feather. One feather would be enough. The hyena shifter opened up a box and yanked out my feather skin. I hadn't even seen them myself since I'd boarded them up behind my mirror months ago. That was the worst thing about being a swan, being forced into hiding from your own soul. I threw myself at them, touched them, and changed instantaneously. I was no longer the ungraceful creature I spent most of my time as on two spindly legs, incapable of flight, and weak and pathetic. I was a beautiful swan, covered in iridescent feathers. I felt agile, precise, and glorious, winding my long neck around, feeling my feathers cover me. I finally was as I was meant to be. No wonder some swans left their feathers on all the time and gave up on being human. All right, bird, you had your chance. Now take him off, the hyena said, snapping at me with his fingers. I hissed at him, trying to flutter my wings forward. My clothes were lost in my transition, like always, but the stupid tape I was bound with was still around my wrists for some reason. Magic, he 
he said with a snort as I realized my predicament. Couldn't risk you getting free. So come out of your skin now, he said before reaching for a knife from a sheath in his pocket. Or I'll cut you out of it and we'll sell your feathers as a novelty. I stepped away from him and shifted back, keeping my feathers out of reach, becoming a whole and naked human beneath them. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. I started apologizing as he crept forward. But he made the mistake of letting his knife down, and I launched myself at him, changing halfway through, knocking him back with my swan's weight and shoving my hard beak with all the strength of my elegant neck directly into his unprotected eye socket. He screamed and started shuddering, trying to stab me with his knife, and one blow landed, but I didn't give a shit. I kept going until he was dead. I fell off of him and started shredding the tape around my wings with my blood-covered beak, thinking only of how I was going to escape. When the room rattled and I heard gunshots up above, I got my wings free. I changed back to human, clutching my feathers to my chest, and then the door to the room opened, and someone threw something in. Namir. And whatever he'd thrown in exploded. I screamed, falling backwards, and if I hadn't had my feathers in front of me like a shield, I would have died, I was sure. As it was now, I was scrambling in the rubble of the room. I'd let them go mid-flight. I needed them. I couldn't let anyone else. A cloud of plaster and smoke drifted by, and a man came out of it. Namir, I said, shouting his name. But he didn't hear me and I didn't hear myself shout it. My ears were ringing so badly. Namir! I tried again, as I watched him bend down. He was in the same suit he'd left this morning in, picking something up off the ground. My feathers. My heart fell through my chest and stomach and hips and down into the earth's molten core. I wasn't safe, and I'd been a fool to ever think I could be. I waited for my life to end but all he did was pick them up. He brought them to his face to scent, breathing them in. Was he tempted? I couldn't tell. There was too much dust, and I was breathing so fast that I was dizzy. Amir, don't, I whispered, willing him to be the man I needed. And, as if he heard me, he carefully folded them up, holding them over one arm, and then reached for his ears to pull protective earplugs out. Amir? I squeaked after that and his head whipped my direction. Lily? He asked, taking me in in sudden horror. What the fuck? I was reading his lips and his attitude more than I could hear him. I paddled my hands near my ears to show him I couldn't hear, while he took me in again, handing me my feathers while he pulled off his sports coat to also hand over. I took it from him and put it on. It hit me at the top of my thigh, like the world's shortest mini dress. I can't hear you. Namir nodded, taking my face into his hand so I was looking at him. Concussive grenades, he mouthed slowly. Because you weren't supposed to be here, he went on, and I could tell he was pissed off at me. Be mad later? I asked him. He nodded, briefly setting his forehead to mine, before picking me up to carry me out. I would have fought, only my shoes were lost, and the room was full of rubble. And then the staircase we were in next was full of bodies. I gasped and tensed, and Namir pulled me close, using one hand to shield my face from what he'd done for me. The lobby at the top of the stairs wasn't much better. Some people's faces had been clawed off, and I knew that the stains on Namir's suit jacket, the one that I was wearing, were from other people's blood. I twisted into him protectively, deciding to just not look at anything else until we were out of the building entirely, where a man I recognized was waiting. Rax, our dragon shifter boss from the casino. He was as tall as the mirror, slightly more built, but with wavier hair, and he looked entirely nonplussed. He began talking at the sight of me, but I couldn't hear him, and I felt the rumble of Namir's chest, probably telling him that. Then he came up to us both, gave me an apologetic gesture, and reached for the feathers I was cradling to my chest. Too little, too late. I hissed at him, just like I would have were I still a swan, and he stepped back. I am sorry, he mouthed, clear enough for me to read it, but I shook him off and let Namir carry me to his sports car. We didn't talk once we were in it. There was no point, and I didn't even ask where we were going. 
I just kept petting my feathers in my lap. It felt so good to see them again and to have been a swan, no matter how briefly. We reached the parking garage of Namir's nice building, and he took me up to his condo. Once we were inside, he gestured for me to give him a moment, so I did, standing in the entryway until he returned, sans tie, with two shots of some amber liquid, a pad of paper, and a pencil between his teeth. He handed the shot over and showed me what he'd written down. If you become your swan, will you be able to hear again? I shrugged. It fixed most everything else. Then he gave me a strange look, downed his shot, set the glass down on his entryway table and wrote, If you show me yours, I'll show you mine. I made a face at him and watched him laugh. Fine, I said, also drinking whatever he'd brought me. It was whiskey, and it made me cough. If this whatever it was was going to work out, we were going to need to discuss my alcoholic beverage preferences. But after that I steeled myself, shucked off his suit coat, and pressed my feathers to my skin, wishing to be a swan again. The change was immediate, and there I was, being stared down by a tiger shifter. His presence made my feathers prickle, and I both wanted to fly away and also stay very, very still. He reached the back of a handout, asking for permission to touch me, and I granted it, bowing my head so that he could touch the soft feathers along my neck. His hand was big enough that he could have wrapped his hand around it and strangled me in an instant. But somehow, I still felt safe. Then he stepped back and gestured at himself, kicking off his shoes, unbuttoning his shirt, reaching for his fly. I changed back into a girl, holding my feathers to my chest like a bath towel, putting a cautious hand out. Lily, he asked, are you all right? I looked between myself, naked, and him halfway there, with his shirt open, making the visible slice of his warm brown skin and abs point down to the top of his boxer briefs like an arrow. Not sure yet, he laughed. We don't have to do anything else. I just figured I'd show you my tiger. But I also didn't want to ruin another suit. More, I mean, considering. He shook his head and let go of an exhale, refastening his suit slacks, which were also stained with blood. What the fuck were you doing there? Getting these, I said, holding my feathers up to show him as they hid me from him. You didn't trust me? He asked, looking pained. I shook my head. You don't understand what it's like. It's not just you. I don't trust anyone. You get why now, don't you? He looked me up and down and nodded solemnly. Yeah, and I guess that I can't blame you. But... Rax says he'll keep them safe for you in his vault. And you can visit them anytime you want. Once I found out that he could have been keeping them safe for you all this time, Lily, he said, a growl catching in his throat. It's okay. I never told him what they were or what they meant to me. I couldn't risk it, so he didn't understand. But nobody does, really, except for other swans. And now you, maybe... I carefully pet my feathers with one hand and realized I'd watched him do the same beneath the auction house. He hadn't been tempted to put them on, not even for a moment. I kept staring at their soft, delicate, fragile white curves and thinking hard. Was I ever going to let another man get this close to me and really know my secret? Not very damn likely. Did it feel right? Yes. But that didn't mean it wasn't frightening. So I crossed the distance between us and offered them out before I could lose my nerve. You can touch them if you want. And maybe put them on. I started talking as fast as my heart was racing. As long as you promise to return them, I don't want someone else being the boss of me for forever. Namir demurred, waving his hands. I don't want to take your feathers, Lily. But I protested, confused and hurt. I want you to have them. The expression on his face softened then, and he took them from me. Not to put them on, though, but to turn and take them further into his place, to lay them on the ground in front of his fireplace. Come here, he said, waving me to follow. Without them, I was naked, metaphorically and literally. I did as he asked, though, until he could take my hand, and he pulled me to stand in the middle of them. After that, he stepped back. I still want to show you my tiger, he said, 
finishing taking his shirt off. He was beautiful and muscular, and I couldn't stop myself from staring. May I? he asked, undoing the top of his suit slacks again. I nodded while watching him strip. And then he was a jerk and changed into a tiger before taking off his boxer briefs in a blur of sudden motion. That's cheating, I protested lightly. You've seen all of me. The creature he was now, massive, furred, and sleek, huffed in amusement, padding toward me on the feathers, and then stopped when he was close enough for me to touch. He still had Namira's green eyes, and they watched me reach out and stroke a finger up the fur on his nose the wrong direction, then sweep my hand up to catch and rub an ear. I felt emboldened then, and started running my hands down the solid length of his neck, shoulders, and back. Petting him felt miraculous, and he was endlessly patient with me doing so, as my fingers traced the outlines of his thick, blunt fangs and his legs down to his claw tips. He closed his eyes and wound his way around me, offering all of himself to be touched, bit by bit, until all of him was on the feathers with me, and he lay down, stretching out to lick a paw, just like a house cat. You're ridiculous, I told him, laying down beside him. I couldn't stop petting him, though, as I wriggled up against him so I could feel his fur against my skin. Namir stopped licking his paw and looked over at me to run his raspy tongue up my cheek. I laughed, wiping his spit away, and when I next opened my eyes, he was a man again, stretched beside me, same as his cat had been. You lured me in, I complained lightly from my position, laying on my feathers. Absolutely, he confessed, coming in for a kiss. I felt him rock over me, and I reached up, tracing my fingers over him again, on skin instead of fur. His free hand roamed as he pushed himself up, pinning me against my feathers below, his hips asking mine to open. I did so readily, all of me already achy and hot, anticipation overwhelming any fear. But instead of taking it like the invitation that it was, he started kissing lower, at my jaw, my neck while my fingers curled in his hair until he found a nipple and lapped at it, using the rough part of his human tongue that still mirrored his cat's to pull it into a soft peak for him to suck on. Namir, I breathed, watching him. My jaw dropped a little, my gaze feeling heavy. He purred a response, and then went to suck on the other, holding the first breast with his hand, teasing the same nipple between his thumb and forefinger. Am I the first person to kiss your breasts, little bird? He asked, lifting up, his pupils as wide as my own surely were. Yes, I whispered, squirming beneath him lightly, encouraging him to hurry up. He chuckled at that, and then started kissing lower, pausing sometimes to gently rasp me with his tongue until his face was almost between my thighs. And will I be the first person to taste you? I nodded, because I knew where his mouth was going, and the thought of it stole my words. His hands held me open, and he breathed me in for a moment before his lips descended on me, pulling at my clit, exposing it for his tongue's soft, rough attention. I had a hand in his hair before I knew what I was doing. I just needed to keep him there. Namir, I whispered again, but this time with a greedy whine, while he made a satisfied sound between my thighs. I'd come before, with my fingers and with toys, but none of those sensations had been like this, like how it felt to be able to watch him as he ate me out, feeling his bearded chin rubbing against my folds as he made hungry sounds, licking and sucking and pulling at my clit. I'd imagined what this moment might be like on a thousand different nights, wondering if I'd ever find someone I could trust to let it happen. And now that I thought I had, I was completely without shame. That feels so good. I whispered, tensing up. Don't stop. He made an acquiescing sound against me as I began to squirm. Oh, God, I said, rising up, my ass clenching, my calves tight, as he growled and held me open for his tongue. I was so close I was panting, but I didn't want to come from this, not when the rest of him was so near. Namir, stop, I whispered. I wanted him in me so badly. Now. Do it. Don't make me wane again. His tongue stilled and he looked up, his mouth close enough to my clit that I could feel it as he breathed his words. Are you sure? 
I nodded again, frantically, letting go of his hair. I licked my lips, held one breast with one hand, and reached for him with the other. He rose up, his lips and chin glistening with my juices as he crawled over me. You don't have to rush, Lily. There will be other nights. I shook my head. That wasn't good enough. I want it to be this one. His expression became one of restrained concern. Do you feel for me as I do for you? I I don't know, Namir. I still hardly know you. And like this, I'm more human than Swan, so maybe I don't get the magic feels like other shifters do. But I know I want to know you, which is more than I can say for anyone else I've ever met. And I desperately want you to fuck me. Doesn't that count? For now, yes, he said, eyeing me studiously. But I want it all, Lily. I want what's in between your legs and your mind and your heart. I want to be the first thing you think of when you wake, and the last before you go to sleep, and every moment in between. My heart began pounding in my chest. You could have had that already if you'd just taken my feathers, I quietly confessed. He gave me a wicked grin. I had some time to hit up Google today, so I know. But my pride requires that you choose me freely. I put my hand against his cheek. Predator-prey relationships never work out, Namir. He twisted his mouth to kiss my palm. Or they're so gloriously happy, no one ever hears from them again. I laughed beneath him. All this time working with you, and I never realized you were a sentimental fool. Namir stared down at me, his green eyes glinting by his firelight, then rose up. The firelight cast half his body in light, the other half in shadow, and I finally got to see what I'd be dealing with. His long, thick erection was folded up against his stomach. It curved up at the tip, and the length of it was covered in fleshy ridges, like the crenellations of a bottle cap, the kind of dick you never see in porn. I watched him stroke himself with his hand, from his head down, following their flow, and then halfway down he pulled up against himself to show how they would flare out in a tight space. They're meant to keep me to you, and you to me, he warned. And I am not a fool, little bird. I'm a tiger who killed innumerable men for the chance to be your mate. And something about the way he said it reached down, made my core squeeze, and made everything that was swan in me rise up, all my stubborn, spiteful willfulness, the parts of me that had kept me alive so far. So do it, I challenged him. Mate me. Don't say that if you don't mean it, Lily, he warned, his voice a low rumble. Or what? I asked him, rising up on both my elbows. You won't fuck me? I am strong enough to walk away from you if need be, he growled. I was breathing hard now and feeling reckless, full of something bigger than myself, an insane pressure that needed to be relieved. From me, maybe, I taunted him, getting on my hands and knees, and wiggling my ass at him, same as if I still had my feathered tail. Then I looked over my shoulder at him and braced, but we both know, Tiger, there's no way you're walking away from this swan tonight. He snarled something incomprehensible, and then reached for me, grabbing both my knees and pulling my legs out from under me. I yelped in surprise, falling down on top of my feathers as he pounced on top of me, spreading my legs wide with his hips. I felt the ridges of his wide shaft stroke down the cleft of my ass, just before he tilted his hips forward so that he could catch the end of his cock where he'd just been licking, playing its blunt tip against my folds and making it rub my clit. I groaned his name and tried to lift my hips up to get him to go inside me, and he rumbled a laugh. You want to get mated so badly now, little bird? He asked, sweeping up my hair to wind around his hand. You want to know what it's like when the tiger catches up? Yes! I hissed. He leaned forward to harshly whisper in my ear, me too, and then notched himself up like an arrow and buried himself inside me. I cried out at once. I hadn't been expecting the sudden fullness or the tearing or the rush of heat as he slid in. It wasn't like anything I could have imagined before because I'd never tried to imagine him. I gave a surprised whimper and then Namir growled in my ear before regaining himself. Lily, 
he gasped, releasing my hair at once, to bend over me, his hips still matched to mine. Don't apologize. You're a tiger. Tigers don't apologize, I panted, catching my breath. This one does, he said, and kissed my shoulder where it met my neck, before bowing his head against my back. I am sorry, little bird, he said, even as I shook my head. I won't move in you again until you tell me to, if you tell me to, he promised. I forced myself to breathe and relax. This was what I'd wanted, and who I'd wanted it with, and how I'd wanted it besides. You can move. A little. Namir made a comforting sound, but didn't thrust. He just slid an arm under me to start to rub my clit in tiny circles. I closed my eyes, remembering the first time I'd ever tried to fly. I'd stolen my own feathers and gone out to a secluded pond to try. I was awful at it for hours, but I never gave up, because I knew I'd managed to. And I remembered the feeling of precisely when I did. Catching the air with my wings and lifting off, finally conquering gravity. It felt like being free. And what if being with someone else felt like that? What if love didn't have to be confining? What if it made you limitless instead? Lily, Namir asked. He nuzzled my cheek with his, his hand slowing down. I twisted to look at him more clearly, breathing hard. If I come, Namir, will we be mated? He made a thoughtful rumble. No, it's more than that, I'm told. Told? He kissed my temple before answering. There can be many firsts tonight. He pulled his hand out from beneath me to balance on, and I could see my virgin blood on his fingers, and where its red now stained my feathers pure white. You're truly that sure of me? I asked him. Swans aren't nice, Namir. We're obstinate and cranky and headstrong. And tigers aren't, he said, holding himself above me while frowning. I don't know how to make it clearer, Lily. I need you in my soul, he said, and then I watched him brace for my rejection. A predator, afraid that his prey would reject his love. I had never been so humbled in my life. I squirmed for my freedom beneath him and felt each of the ridges along his shaft rub and pull my walls as he granted it, leaning back, the expression on his face looking more stricken by the moment, until I turned over beneath him. I want to see you. I could tell he didn't dare to hope, so I went on. Swans are bossy, and it takes us a while to make up our minds. But once we do, we mate for life. I reached up to take his face between my palms. This feels right. A slow smile spread across his face as he lowered himself over me again, matching his body with mine. Then open wide, little bird, he said, going down on one elbow to cradle the back of my head with a hand. Open wide and let me in. I nodded, winding my legs around his hips as his lips met mine, and he started pushing forward. Lily, he whispered as the first ridge on his cock passed through, and then he paused there, tugging it against my entrance. More, I told him, continuing to nod. Namir, I want everything. He gave me a look of delight, and then took me at my word. My head rolled back as he plunged himself deep, and then his mouth was on my neck, and I could feel him inside of me, the curve of his cock and the ridges on it rubbing hard against my walls as he shifted himself minutely, not thrusting, just moving enough to make me ache for more. You're so wet, Lily, he murmured appreciatively. Well, I am a water bird, I said. Namir sagged his head and groaned while I snickered, and I tapped him so he'd look at me. Look, you're the one who wanted this. It's not my fault you didn't know I have a corny sense of humor. He laughed, and I could feel it rumbling inside and out, and I'd never known anything as good. I guess I'll get used to it, he said, sounding like a complaint, even as his entire face was beaming. I ran a hand through his hair as he looked up and smiled at him. I think you'll have to. He took me in then, like he was seeing me for the first time, before leaning in to kiss me softly at first, before deepening, and I made a surrendering sound, wrapping my arms around him as he started to thrust. His ridges spread me open, one by one, as he pulled out, and then stretched me again as he filled me back up again. I moaned beneath him, into his mouth, rocking my hips in his time. Namir, 
I whispered when he pulled up. Do you like that little bird? Very much, I confessed. Good, he agreed. He came in and bit my lower lip, pulling it up between his teeth, and all of me squeezed until he let it go. I want to fuck you faster, Lily. Harder, too, he warned. Yes, I breathed. Please. And he held himself above me, holding my face in his hands, watching me as he took me, and I had never felt so known or owned. Because for all that I was a bird and he was a cat, what we were together was meant to be. I could feel it where we met each time he filled me, and the way my body reacted to his, and the friction building between us as he kept stretching me wide and thudding in deep. It's so good, Lily, he groaned before kissing me ferociously and chasing the last of any fears I might have had away. I know, I said, clawing my hands up his scalp through his hair. I couldn't even have explained how I knew, since he was my first time, but I did. Fuck, I did. Namir, I whispered, feeling tight and full, so fucking full of him, like he was always meant to be inside me. Usually I needed to touch my clit, but the way he was taking me, how turned on I was, and how much I needed this to happen. Namir, I whined, squeezing my thighs around him. Fuck, this is what it's supposed to be like. Fuck, he harshly whispered, bowing his forehead to mine. Little bird, please. Fuck, come, he grunted in time with his thrusts. And for maybe the first time in my life, I did as I was told. I threw my arms around his neck and screamed. My orgasm rippled out of me from my core, slamming through me hard and then rebounding, making me clamp down tight and pulsing waves. Namir growled above me, a completely wild sound, and covered me as I thrashed, shoving me as full of him as I could take, again and again, until he was coming too. I knew it by his snarling, and the way his hips erratically rammed into mine, before he collapsed above me, both of us covered in sweat and with only barely enough room to breathe. Namir nuzzled his face against mine, just like a cat, I thought, with a stuporous grin, before he pulled back, still breathing hard. I knew you were my mate, Lily. I'm glad one of us was sure, I said, stroking a hand gently against him, before I realized from his expression he had more to say. And you're going to be trapped on me for a bit here, he said, rocking both of us with his hips. I could still feel how hard and full he was inside me. Don't panic. Don't panic? I repeated, blinking back to attention. You do realize telling people not to panic literally does the opposite of that? He gave me an apologetic wince. It's a cat shifter thing. When we mate with the right person, there's fleshy barbs. It shouldn't hurt. Excuse me? I said, pushing up on my elbows beneath him. I'm not sure the word fleshy makes the word barb better. Wait, why didn't you warn me? I watched him grit his teeth because this never happened before, and I didn't want to scare you. I squinted up at him, reading between the lines. Because you weren't sure it was going to, I said, hitting him on his shoulder. He stared down at me with his amazingly deep green eyes that I already knew I would never get tired of looking into. No, he finally confessed. But everything in me wanted it to happen. And that part, I believed. I grinned up at him, my lips curving mischievously. Well, now that you're trapped on me, I said, pretending to take the power back in the situation, maybe we should talk about normal getting-to-know-you things. Like my favorite cheese is Swiss, and I really enjoy karaoke. I fell back onto my feathers, giggling, elated. I'd shown my feathers to a man. He hadn't stolen them. They would always be safe soon, and somehow, even though I was pinned on Namir's cock, I had gained my actual freedom by his side. Don't laugh, Namir warned, even though he was laughing too. If you make me hard again, little bird, I'll... You'll... I taunted him, sweeping my arms up behind his head. What? Have to fuck me again? Or be stuck with me forever? Both, he growled possessively, coming in to kiss my throat. 
Just as long as you know I'm 90% sure you're going to have to meet my parents tomorrow, I warned him, and I could feel his smile against my skin before he answered. I'll do anything, Lily, as long as I get to keep you. Thank you for listening. For more of Cassie Alexander's stories and audiobooks, be sure to check out her website at www.cassiealexander.com.